organism. And finally, you should be able to explain the characteristics of life. Now, learning targets, you're going to be seeing them at the beginning of every lesson that we do. And learning targets are super important because they will guide both my teaching and your learning. You should always use learning targets as mini goals um, in order to assess whether or not you understood the assignment or whether or not you understood the topic at hand. So this means that as you are watching this video, these are the points um, or the learning targets that you need to keep in mind. And when you're done watching the video, I want you to go back to these learning targets and to ask yourself whether or not you can answer these questions. If you are able to answer all of these questions or all of these learning targets, um, then you most likely have gained a grasp, a strong grasp of the topic. If you go back and you try to answer the learning targets and you're unsure, um, then you probably should rewatch the video or ask me some clarification questions. Okay, so um, in, in terms of the big concepts we're covering today or the key concepts, um, biology is a study of all forms of life and science is defined as the study of the natural world. So usually we have several types of sciences. Uh, biology focuses on our study of living organisms. Okay, so any living organism that exists on our planet, um, we use biology in order to study it. Chemistry and physics are also forms of sciences, but they study different things. So they study different things about the natural world. Chemistry focuses on chemicals and how they combine. And we will be covering a little bit of chemistry during our course this year. So biochemistry or the combination of both biology and chemistry are quite related. And you know our understanding of chemistry will be very important for a full understanding of a lot of the biological processes that we will cover. Finally, we have physics, which is the study of the environment. Now, you probably have covered a little bit of biology, chemistry, and physics in middle school, but this year we are focusing mostly on biology. Now, when we're studying biology, um, since we have life on many levels, okay, or on many different levels in our planet, we study different levels of life, all right? So the biggest and the largest level is the biosphere. And this level includes all living things and all the places that they are found. So the biosphere is essentially everywhere on our planet and our atmosphere where life exists. So therefore, the biosphere will, will cover so many different areas. It includes the land environments, so all the land environments that we see, um, and also underneath uh, the, the, the Earth's surface. So anything on the surface of the Earth, but also underneath the surface, because deep in the surface of our planet, we have living organisms, including microbes, okay? So things like certain types of bacteria. Actually, if you were to dig five kilometers into the surface of the earth. So if we, if we stand at the surface and we try to basically run, we're able to dig just like Sonic, Sonic the Hedgehog, we're able to dig all the way into the um, surface of our planet and we move five kilometers in, we will still be able to encounter microbes or certain types of bacteria which are essentially living things. All right, so as you can see, when we're talking about land environments, um, there's different biomes, and each biome has certain characteristics, all right, which means that it will have certain organisms living there. So um, tropical rainforest is going to have very different types of organisms than desert. And organisms living in these biomes, living in these different types of environments, are going to have different characteristics to help them cope and to help them live um, and adapt to these certain um, environments and environmental factors. The biosphere also includes water environments. So salt water and fresh water also include living things. So we, we will usually be um, studying uh, things like uh, aquatic organisms and marine organisms in a sub, sub, uh, subject of biology known as marine biology, all right? So, Again, since we do have life in freshwater and saltwater environments, um, we will use biology to study these organisms that are found there. And finally, um, we, the biosphere also includes 
portions of the atmosphere. So the gases that surround our planet also include life. And usually this is in the form of microbes, bacteria. A lot of the life that exists, whether it be on land, underneath the Earth's surface, in the water environments, and even in the atmosphere, we cannot see. So even though we cannot see these organisms, they are there, okay? They are there, they are microscopic, but they are there, they exist. When we're trying to figure out um, the variety of life, so we know that on every one of these different environments, okay, and, and every one of these uh, different parts of the biosphere, we have life. Um, we, we sometimes talk about the variety of, of life, and this is defined as biodiversity. Whenever you see the word bio, we are referring to living things. So bio means life and diversity means variety. So how many different types of species exist in a certain area? This is known as biodiversity, the variation of life that exists in one area. Now biodiversity generally increases as we move from the poles to the equator. Okay, so as we move from the poles of our planet, right here, towards the center, towards the equator, biodiversity increases. So we have more variety in the types of organisms that we see. Think about the uh, North Pole or Antarctica, for example, versus uh, a tropical rainforest in the Amazon. Which one do you think would have... Which one do you think would have a higher variety or more biodiversity? The tropical rainforest in the Amazon or Antarctica? If we think to the types of organisms, including plants and animals that exist in these two different environments, we generally know that there are a lot more variety in organisms in the aquatic rainforest than in a cold location such as Antarctica. And this is because as we move towards the equator to the center here, the temperatures become warm, okay? So they become warmer, but also there's a lot more rainfall. These warmer temperatures and the fact that there's a lot more rainfall both contribute to a higher degree of biodiversity, which means that uh, the, the climate and the weather conditions that exist in areas that are more tropical um, allow for more organisms and more different kinds of organisms to exist. Now, a species is defined as one particular type of living thing, all right? So essentially, members of a species are able to both interbreed and to reproduce. Uh, and if they do not fit this definition, then we do not consider them in the same species. So even though organisms might look very similar, okay, physically, um, they, uh, are, they will only be considered in the same species if they are able to interpre interbreed and reproduce. So they are uh, basically the same particular type of living thing, and they usually will, will share very close DNA. Now, there are around 2 million different types of living species that have been identified by scientists. But this is less than one quarter of the total species that are estimated to be present in our planet. Why do you think there are so many undiscovered species? So we're talking scientists with all the technology and all of the research that they have done over all of this time that we have existed um, on this planet, we were only able to identify one quarter of all the organisms that exist. Why is that? Let's think back to what we were talking in the beginning. We said that even though there are so many organisms that exist on land, underneath the, the surface, and on our, in our atmosphere, many of them are microscopic. They're tiny and we cannot see them with the naked eye. And therefore, they are somewhat difficult to identify. So this is the first reason. The second reason is that a lot of the organisms exist in areas of our planet that are very difficult to reach, such as deep ocean vents and below the Earth's surface. In order for scientists to discover these organisms, they need to have 
you know, advanced technologies that allow them to allow them to reach these uh, certain locations. All right. So these are generally the main reasons why, even though there are a lot more organisms out there in our planet, we have only discovered two million, which sounds like a huge number, but compared to what's still out there to be discovered, it's a very small fraction. Now. Whenever, organ whenever scientists identify an organism, they need to follow uh, certain guidelines or certain characteristics for them to identify whether or not this organism is alive, okay, or whether or not this organism is considered living. Now, we know that biology studies all forms of life, but how do scientists determine if something is alive? How do we look at a plant um, and know that it is a living thing, but then we look at a rock and we know that it is a non-living thing. What makes a rock non-living while a plant living? What characteristics are scientists considering? All right, so uh, essentially, if we were to define an organism, an organism is one individual living thing, and usually it must, uh, or not usually, always it must follow the, these characteristics of life. The first one is that they, the organism must be made from at least one cell, so one or more cells. The second characteristic of life um, is that they uh, need to have some form of energy that they will use for metabolism. And metabolism are all the reactions that um, happen in an organism's body, all right? So breaking down food, that's the type of metabolism. Um, you know, making, uh, collecting oxygen and uh, exchanging that or exchanging carbon dioxide with oxygen, respiration, that is another form. So all of these reactions, all of these reactions that usually happen in our bodies and in the bodies of living things, this is what we mean by metabolism. So organisms need some form of energy for metabolism. So when you had lunch today, all right, whatever that lunch might have been, that is you trying to gain or get some form of energy in order for you for, to power this machine that is your body and these reactions that are happening every second that you are alive in order to keep you alive, all right? Other organisms such as plants use a very different form of energy. So they actually can harness, so instead of eating food directly, they are able to use the sun's energy to make food which is sugar in the form of sugar, in order to power up these reactions that happen in the metabolism or the metab metabolic processes that occur in their bodies. We also have different organisms um, that will use chemicals as a form of energy that they then convert to sugar or to food in order to keep them alive. A very interesting example um, of, of, of organisms that use energy in order to, or that use chemicals in order to create food, are chemolithoautotrophs, okay? I'm gonna be posting another short video um, in addition to this one, where I will talk more about chemolithoautotrophs. Now, these organisms are found deep underneath our Earth's surface, and they use chemicals found in rocks, such as surf, uh, sulfur, iron, and carbon, they basically take those chemicals, they break them down, they convert them into food in order to keep them alive. So when we look at a rock, we don't think of it as food, but these organisms, they feed on rocks, okay? And I will talk more about that in that video, which I will post in addition to this, um, in addition to this lesson. Um, the last characteristic of life that we want to talk about is that all organisms must have some form of DNA or genetic material that they will pass on from one generation to the next. So they will pass on to their offspring. Notice that here I, I say the characteristics of life include. This means that there are more characteristics of life and you have already covered this in middle school. If you remember, um, you, you use the, uh, the, you use this, the, I think it was called Mrs. Gren, if I believe, okay? Um, so that, that was how you remembered all the different characteristics of life in middle school, Mrs. Gren. And 
those were like seven, I guess, uh, characteristics of life. But for us, for this year, we are focusing on these because um, these essentially include a lot of the characteristics. So we are combining more than one characteristic into one. And that is it for today. Um, so again, if you do have any questions regarding today's lesson, please make sure to write those questions down because tomorrow when we meet during class, we will be discussing a little bit more about these, um, the things that I talked about in today's lesson, and I will be answering all of your questions. Have a great day.